sinks, therefore, it must reach a depth where the water below it is just viscous enough to stop its fall. In short, it stops sinking and ends up floating on an underwater surface, beyond the reach of the storms but far above the ocean floor. It's calm there, dead calm. Some stricken ships have rigging, some even have sails, many still have crew tangled in the rigging or lashed to the wheel. But the voyages still continue, aimlessly, with no harbour in sight. Because there are currents under the ocean, and so the dead ships with their skeleton crews sail on around the world over sunken cities and between drowned mountains until rot and shipworms eat them away and they disintegrate. So sometimes an anchor drops all the way to the dark, cold calmness of the abyssal plain and disturbs the stillness of centuries by throwing up a cloud of silt. One nearly hit Ang Hammerad, where he sat watching the ships drift by far overhead. He remembered it because it was the only really interesting thing to happen in the last 9,000 years. The one month program. There was this disease that the Klax men got. It was like the illness known as Kalencha, which sailors experienced when, after having been becalmed for weeks under a pitiless sun, they suddenly believed that the ship was surrounded by green fields and stepped overboard. Sometimes the Klax men thought they could fly. There was about eight miles between the big semaphore towers, and when you were at the top, there were maybe a hundred and they thought they could jump from one to the other, or ride on the invisible metal sneaking down the tower. Or perhaps you thought that you were a messenger. Perhaps, as some said, all this was nothing more than a disturbance in the brain caused by the wind in the rigging. No one knew for sure. People who step onto the air 150 feet above the ground seldom have much to discuss afterwards. The tower shifted gently in the wind, but that was okay. There were lots of new designs in this tower. It stored the wind to power its mechanisms. It bent rather than broke. It acted more like a tree than a fortress. You could build most of it on the ground and raise it into place in an hour. It was a thing of grace and beauty. And it could send messages up to four times faster than the old towers, thanks to the new shutter system and the coloured lights. At least, it would be able to, once they sorted out a few lingering problems. The young man climbed swiftly to the very top of the tower. For most of the way, he was in clinging grey morning mist, and then he was rising through glorious sunlight, the mist spreading below him all the way to the horizon like a sea. He paid the view no attention. He'd never dreamed of flying. He dreamed of mechanisms, of making things work better than they'd ever done before. But now, he wanted to find out what was making the new shutter a stick again. He oiled the sliders, checked the tension on the wires, and then swung himself out over fresh air to check the shutters themselves. It wasn't what he was supposed to do. Every night was the only way to get things done. Anyway, it was perfectly safe if you... There was a clink. He looked back and saw the snap hook of his safety ring lying on the walkway. Saw the shadow felt the terrible pain in his fingers, heard the scream and dropped, like an anchor. Chapter 1, The Angel, in which our hero experiences hope, the greatest gift, the bacon sandwich of regret. Somber reflections on capital punishment from the hangman. Famous last words. Our hero dies. Angels. Conversations about inadvisability of misplaced offers regarding broomsticks, an unexpected ride, a world free of honest men, a man on the pond. There is always a choice. They say that the prospect of being hanged in the concentrates on is one thing. Unfortunately, what the mind never really concentrates on is that in the morning it will be in a body that is going to be hanged. Going to be hanged had been named Moist Fond Fig by doting if unwise parents, but he was not going to embarrass the name insofar as that was still possible by being hung under it. The world in general, and particularly on that bit of it known as the death warrant, was Alfred Spangler. And he took a more positive approach to the situation and had concentrated his mind on the prospect of the big and most particularly on the prospect of So far, the work has taken him five weeks, and we the spoon to something like a nail file. Fortunately, no one has to change the bedding here, or else they would discover the world's 
heavy stone was currently the object of his attentions. And at some point, a huge staple had been hammered into it as an anchor for manacles. Moist sat down facing the wall, gripped the iron ring in both hands, braced his legs against the stones on either side, and heaved. His shoulders caught fire and a red mist filled his vision, but the block slid out with a faint and inappropriate tinkling noise. Moist managed to ease it away from the hole and peered inside. At the far end was another block, and the mortar around it looked suspiciously strong and fresh. Just in front of it was a new spoon. It was shiny. As he studied it, he heard the clapping behind him. He turned his head, tendons twanging a little riff of agony, and saw several of the wardens watching him through the bars. Well done, Mr Spangler, said one of them. Ron here owes me five dollars. I told him you were a sticker. He's a sticker, I said. You set this up, did you, Mr Wilkinson? said Moist weakly, watching the glint of light on the spoon. No, not us, sir. Lord Fettin, I'm his orders. He insists that all condemned prisoners should be offered the prospect of freedom. Freedom? But there's a damn great stone through there. Yes, there is that, sir. Yes, there is that, sir. It's only the prospect, you see, not actual freedom as such. <laughs> That'd be a bit dark, eh? I suppose so, yes, said Moist. He didn't say but The wardens had treated him quite civilly these past six weeks, and he made a point of getting on with people. He was very, very good at it. People's skills were part of his stock of trade. They were nearly the whole of it. Besides, these people had big sticks. So, speaking carefully, he added, some people might consider this cruel, Mr. Wilkinson. Yes, sir. We asked him about that, sir, but he said no, it wasn't. He said it provided his forehead wrinkled. Och, you patient all therapy. Healthy exercise prevented moping and offered that greatest of all treasures, which is hope, sir. Hope, muttered Moist glumly. Not upset, are you, sir? Upset? Why should I be upset, Mr. Wilkinson? Only the last bloke we had in this cell, he managed to get down that drain, sir. Very small man, very accurate. He dismissed it out of hand. Does it lead to the river? He said. The water grinned. You'd think so, wouldn't you? He was really upset when we fished him out. Nice to see you've entered into the spirit of the thing, sir. You've been an example to all of us, sir, the way you kept going. Stuffing all the dust in your mattress. Very clever. Very tidy. Very neat. It's really cheered us up having you in here. Oh, by the way, Mrs Wilkinson says thanks very much for the fruit basket. Very posh it is. It's got kumquats even. Don't mention it, Mr Wilkinson. The warden was a bit green about the kumquats, cos he only got dates in his, but I told him, sir, that fruit baskets is like life. Until you've got the pineapple off of the top, you never know what's underneath. He says thank you too. Glad he liked it, Mr Wilkinson, said Moist absent-mindedly. Several of his former landladies had brought in presents to the poor and the poor. And Moist always invested in generosity. A career like his was all about style. On that um, general subject, sir, said Mr Wilkinson, should the man were wondering if you might like to unburden yourself at this point in time, on the subject of the whereabouts of the place where the location of the spot is where, um, not to beat about the bush, Stand you hid all that money you stole. The jail went silent. Even the cockroaches were listening. No, I couldn't do that, Mr Wilkinson, said Moist loudly, after a decent pause for dramatic effect. He tapped his jacket pocket, held up a finger and winked. The warders grinned back. We understand totally, sir. Now I'd get some rest if I was you, sir, cos we're hanging you in half an hour, said Mr Wilkinson. Hey! Did I get breakfast? Breakfast isn't until seven o'clock, sir, said the warder reproachfully. But, tell you what, I'll do your bacon sandwich, cos it's you, Mr Spangler. But now it was a few minutes before them, and it was him being led down the short corridor and out into the little room under the scaffold. Moist realised he was looking at himself from a distance, as if part of himself was floating outside his body like a child's balloon. Ready as a to let go of the string. This lit by light coming through cracks in the scaffold floor above, and significantly from around the edges of the large trap door. The hinges of said door were being carefully oiled by a man in a hood. He stopped and saw the light. 
Good morning, Mr. Spangler. He raised the hood helpfully. It's me, sir, Daniel Woodrock Trooper. I am your executioner for today, sir. Don't you worry, sir. I've hanged dozens of people. We'll soon have you out of here. Is it true that if a man isn't hanged after three attempts, he's reprieved, Dan? said Moist, as the executioner carefully wiped his hands on a rag. So I've heard, sir, so I've heard. But they don't call me one drop for nothing, sir. And will, sir, be having the black bag today? Will it help? Some people think it makes them look a bit more dashing, sir, and it stops that pop-eyed look. It's more a crowd thing, really. Quite a big one out there this morning. Nice piece about you in the Times yesterday, I suppose. All them people saying what a nice old man you were and everything. Uh, would you mind signing the rope before it, sir? I won't have a chance to ask you after the day. Signing the rope, said the person. Yes, sir, said the It's sort of traditional. There's a lot of people out there who buy the rope. Specialist collectors, you can say. It's great, but it takes all sorts, eh? The world's all signed, of course. He flourished a length of stout rope. I've got a special pen that signs on rope. One signature every couple of inches. Straightforward signature, no dedication needed. Worth money to me, sir. I'd be very grateful. Uh, so grateful that you won't hang me then, said Moist, taking the pen. This got an appreciative laugh. Mr. Trooper watched him sign along the length, nodding happily. Well done, sir. That's my pension plan you're signing there. Now, are we ready, everyone? Not me, said Moist quickly to another round of general amusement. You're a car, Mr. Spangler, said Mr. Wilkinson. It won't be the same without you around, and that's the trick. Apart from all those repossessions, bankruptcies and sudden insolvencies, what had he actually done that was bad as such? He'd only been moving numbers around. Nice crowd turned out today, said Mr. Trooper, tossing the end of the rope over the beam and busying himself with knots. Lots of press too. What gallows covers them all, of course. There's the Times and the Pseudopolis Herald, probably because of that bank that collapsed there. And I heard there's a man from the Stall Plains dealer too. Very good financial section. I always keep an eye on new world prices. Looks like a lot of people want to see you dead, sir. Moist was aware that a black coach had drawn up at the rear of the crowd. There was no sort of Waving at you. The hangman glanced down at the clerk and struggled to the front of the crowd. 
Under whose idiosyncratically despotic rule, Ankh-Morpork had become the city where, for some reason, everyone wanted to live. An ancient animal sense also told Moist that other people were standing behind the comfortable chair, and that it could be extremely uncomfortable should he make any sudden movements. But they couldn't be as terrible as the thin, black red man with the fussy little beard and the pianist's hands who was watching him. Shall I tell you about angels, Mr. Lipvig? said the patrician pleasantly. I know two interesting facts about them. Moist grunted. There were no obvious escape routes in front of him, and turning around was out of the question. His neck ached horribly. Though, yes, you were hanged, said Vetinari. A very precise science hanging. Mr. Trooper is a master. The slippage and thickness of the rope, whether the knot is here rather than there, the relationship between weight and distance. Oh, I'm sure the man who wrote a book. You were hanged to within half an inch of your life, I understand. Only an expert standing right next to you spotted that. And in this case, the expert is our friend. No, Alfred is dead, Mr. Lipvig. Any other people would swear they saw him die. And so, appropriately, it is a thing of course I wish to talk to you now. The first interesting thing about angels, Mr. Lipvig, is that some of them are very rarely at a point in a man's career where he has made such a foul and tangled mess of his life that death appears to be the only sense of option. An angel appears to him, I should say, unto him, and offers him a chance to go back to the moment when it all went wrong, and this time do it right. Mr. Lipvig, I should like you to think of me as an angel. Moist stared. He'd felt the snap of the rope, the choke of the noose. He'd seen the blackness swelling up. He died. I'm offering you a job, Mr. Lipvig. Alfred Spangler is ready, but Mr. Lipvig has a future. It may, of course, be a very short one if he is stupid. I'm offering you a job, Mr. Lipvig. Well, for wages. I realize the concept may be unfamiliar. The job is that of Postmaster General of the Ankh Morpork Post Office. Moist continued to stare. May I just add, Mr. Lipvig, that behind you there is a door. If at any time in this interview you feel you wish to leave, you have only to step through it and you will never hear from me again. Moist filed that under, deeply suspicious. To continue, the job involves the refurbishment and running of the city's postal service, preparation of the international packets, maintenance of post office property, etc., etc. Just take a boom at my arse, I can't sleep before two comes at a voice. Moist realised it was his. He prayed his nets. Two comes a shock to him at the afternoon with this one. Lord Vetinari gave him a long, long look. Well, you can reach, he said, and turned to a hobby and asked, Drum! Does the housekeeper have a storm cover on this wall, you know? They're open. 
against my own. Such a dog. Chow, I it was a joke. but I don't know anything about delivering post. Mr. Whitby, this morning you had no experience at all. And yes, but for my intervention, you nevertheless turned out extremely good at it, said Lord Bethnari sharply. It just goes to show you never know until you try. But when you sentenced me, Bethnari raised a pale hand. No, he said. Moist's brain, at least aware that it needed to do some work here, stepped in and replied, Um, when you sentenced...